Governor Pritzker, thank you for taking the time this evening. Great to be here. Uh, let's dive right in because there's okay. no shortage of news uh, to cover. And I want to start actually with a letter that you recently wrote to President Biden requesting more federal assistance and coordination in managing the migrant crisis here in Chicago. So what specifically are you seeking from the Biden administration and what has the response from the White House been? Well, I have to say they've jumped on it uh, in a way that I didn't expect, and that's uh, a good thing. Uh, there's more that needs to be done, there's no doubt about it, but I wrote the letter because I wanted to be very clear and very public about what it is that we need to help us here in Illinois and in the city of Chicago. Um, one example of something that I said that was really a national in scope is that the federal government really needs to take over the logistics of the arrivals of asylum seekers. That is, we can't leave it to the governor of Texas or to mayors in various cities in Texas. We need to make sure that people are being dispersed into places where they can be cared for, where they can get the health care and uh, shelter and make sure that they have the things they need moving forward. In the city of Chicago and in the state of Illinois, we're a welcoming state. We care deeply about addressing this humanitarian crisis, and we're doing everything that we can. And with the numbers that are being sent here, there just got to be an overwhelming uh, sense that we won't be able to manage a as large a crowd as now the governor of Texas and those other politicians are sending us. They've ratcheted up the numbers, uh, sending them to Chicago, and it's clearly a political move on their part. Uh, and we just need help. So I wanted to outline that they need to help us with the logistics, making sure that we're distributing folks to places, to nonprofit NGOs that can help all across the country. That's one thing. And then a second thing I might say is that uh, we need those work authorizations to happen faster. And by the way, each one of those work authorizations costs more than $500. You can imagine that an asylum seeker who's here who isn't able to get a job now may not have $500. And there are an awful lot of them. And so we basically ask for a waiver of the $500 uh, application fee. You know, you mentioned Illinois is a welcoming state. And to be sure, these asylum seekers are people who are fleeing war, violence, poverty, uh, especially in Central America. But I do want to ask if you think that um, there need to be any changes to asylum or border policies at the federal level to prevent so many people from coming at once. Well, let's start with what we really need, which is comprehensive immigration reform. We need to secure the border, but we also need to make sure that we're running a process of bringing people into the United States. Uh, immigration is good for our economy. Let's all stop on that point. We need to make sure that we are bringing people here and allowing them to work. We have jobs. We know that we need more people. You know, if you didn't bring any immigration to the United States by 2030, our population would be declining. Uh, we have always uh, had immigration in the United States. We need to allow it, and it needs to be legal. It needs to be fair. Uh, and that's not something the Republican Party, honestly, seems like they want to do. Uh, they, all they want to be about is, you know, uh, close the border, don't let anybody in. Well, that's so incredibly short-sighted. And by the way, I think there are a number of them that just say that, but actually when they go home to their districts, the businesses in their districts and so many others are saying to them, we need immigration, help us out. But, you know, they're following their leader, Emperor Palpatine. Uh, and uh, and it, it is, uh, it's disturbing. And, and the rest of us would like very much to reach a compromise here where, again, we're, we have border security, where we have enforcement at the border, but we also have uh, an immigration plan that brings lots of people into the United States. I mean, it, it's, it's really challenging uh, to get consensus around immigration reform. I, I covered the debate in 2013. That was perhaps the last comprehensive effort on both sides of the aisle to get immigration reform done. But ultimately, any time this conversation happens on Capitol Hill, a deal falls through. Now you have a Republican-led House. Pretty certain a lot of the proposals you just mentioned are dead on arrival. So in light of that, should the Biden administration be doing more? Should President Biden be doing more through executive action 
uh, to, to, I think, help improve some of the challenges in the immigration system that you're speaking to. Yes, but some of it requires funding, and only the Congress can make that funding available. And so you've got to work with Congress to make it happen. Of course, there are things that the executive branch can do on its own. But I have to say, the president is looking for all of those things that he might be able to do. You need to have Republicans and Democrats working together. I know that seems almost impossible these days, but it, it is what is necessary. Now, I hope that what's happened in the House of Representatives with the, you know, the eight, I don't know what to call them, you know, rogue, uh, you know, crazy right wing uh, Republicans that have essentially overturned uh, the, uh, you know, the election of their speaker, uh, that that as a result of that turmoil, that maybe people will come to their senses. Maybe people will say, you know, we need to get back to working together and not uh, having the, you know, the, the extreme right wing controlling the Congress. And I, I think that if that could happen, and I, you know, I'm ever hopeful, uh, that we could see some immigration reform. And it's the moment to do it, by the way, right? Because we know that we need border security, and we also know that we need to have immigration reform. And I think people can come in from both sides, each party, and actually find some middle ground. Again, we need funding also for enforcement and also to help us move people through the s asylum seeker system uh, so that we can get them to the point where they might be able to work. And you said the White House uh, did respond fairly quickly to your letter, but I did want to ask if you're concerned that the burden um, th that finding shelter for these migrants here in Chicago is placing on the city could potentially interfere with or overshadow uh, its ability to host the Democratic National Convention next summer. We will manage it, but I, as I've said before, we, we need... We have the city and the state working together. We need the federal government at the table here. Uh, and it's not just for the city of Chicago and about a convention. This is also about New York City. It's also about Washington, D.C. It's also about Denver and many other cities. Um, this is just not something that we can let fester. Uh, and, I, and I know that the White House understands that. And as you saw, after the letter that we delivered, there was a lot of action uh, on their part. And I'm, I'm hopeful, watching the follow through, that we're going to see uh, some positive effect for us. And lastly, on this, have you spoken to the president directly on this subject? And after you sent the letter, did you hear from President Biden? I did not call the president after I sent the letter. I did talk to many of the leaders in the White House uh, before that. And I have spoken with the president several times over the last 13 months about the need for help for all of our cities. Uh, it is not right that you've got Republican politicians at the border, mostly Republicans, who are sending busloads of people only to Democratic cities and Democratic states. That's not right. This is a federal government responsibility, and the president does understand that. And so they're now taking action that I think will be helpful. And, you know, I, I brought up the Democratic National Convention, so I'd re be remiss if I didn't ask you how important of a moment that is going to be for the city of Chicago. Well, all of you who are involved with IOP, I hope you're going to get involved with the Democratic National Convention. It's a great thing for the city of Chicago. And, and you know, Chicago has hosted more conventions, Democratic and Republican conventions, than any other city in the country by far. And it's because we're a great city. It's because we have uh, great accommodations for hosting something like that. And um, we made a, a, you know, a, a mighty pitch, uh, you know, beating out Atlanta and Houston and New York City for the convention. Um, it, it's a great thing for the city. We have 50,000 people that are coming. We have uh, lots of people who are engaged in the activities across the city of Chicago uh, as we move toward the convention. More political activity engagement is good for Democrats. And nominating Joe Biden and Kamala Harris for another term in office in Chicago is perfect. We're the blue wall. Uh, we are the center of the blue wall. And uh, Michigan, Wisconsin, Minnesota, I mean, think about how those states have moved toward the Democratic Party. Uh, and it has been with Illinois becoming, uh, electing more Democrats um, and being the center of the activity for the Midwest, uh, making it, well, you know, a Democratic stronghold. I do. I will come back to policy, but now that we're talking about the election uh, and there's a lot of focus on uh, President Biden, 
uh, and his seeking a second term in office. Mm -hmm. You know, many polls, and this is this is before he officially announced his reelection campaign, and and since. Um, it, it, you've seen in those polls concerns from a majority of American voters and a majority of Democrats about his age and, you know, a preference among, in many of these surveys, a majority of voters to see someone else at the top of the ticket. What do you say to those voters? Well, I think, of course, we have uh, more than a year between now and the general election. And one of the things that we'll be reminding people is that Joe Biden, number one, this is genuinely the most empathetic president that I've seen in my lifetime. This is someone who genuinely cares about working families, cares about people, and he demonstrates it in so many ways. We ought to have a leader that demonstrates that to people. It's who we are, I think, as a country. The majority of people believe that. That's number one. Number two, Joe Biden, because he is experienced, and some people want to say, oh, look at his age. But look at what he's done in his lifetime, and importantly, in two and a half years as president of the United States, look at what he's gotten done, more than most presidents get done in eight years in office. Bipartisan legislation that rescued the economy, that's helping to bring manufacturing back to the United States, that's building on our clean energy future and investing in future technologies. That couldn't have happened in a divided world that we're all living in unless you had somebody who knew how to talk across the aisle and he got bipartisan support for most of the things that he's gotten done. And, you know, I think it's worth noting that um, President Biden's most likely opponent appears to be former President Trump, who is only three years uh, younger than President Biden. But on the potential for a rematch of the 2020 election, I know it's early, the polls can only tell us so much, but what does it say to you that President Biden and former President Trump appear to be in a statistical tie in most, not just national polls, but even key battleground polls, a lot of those states that you mentioned a few minutes ago, even though former President Trump has been indicted four times? Well, let's remember that uh, we have not gotten into the head-to-head -head competition of a campaign. That just hasn't happened. You've got a mess going on on the Republican side, um, and you've got uh, on the Democratic side, Joe Biden, who's you know got, got a lot to manage uh, in the nation and in the world, and he's doing the job. And I think that when we get to the point where we're actually having the head-to-head -head matchup, not in a poll, because you know playing that you know polar coaster game of looking at every poll and wondering if this means the death of one of the other of the candidates uh, for getting elected uh, is not a fruitful endeavor. You know that, you know, back in 2011 at about this time, everybody said Barack Obama is done. He couldn't possibly get reelected in 2012. And he went on to a stunning, I mean, a really successful uh, uh, election. So I think that there's a lot of time that this is going to play out. And I think reminding people what's at stake uh, hasn't really happened yet. You know, one of the key messages that you've heard from President Biden's reelection campaign, even in these early stages, is, you know, that the economy has really improved under his watch. And we've seen that, I mean, working at the Wall Street Journal and all of the economic coverage that we have at, at, at my paper, um, you know, consumer confidence is high. There's been, you know, very positive job growth. Wages are up. Um, but at the same time, there seems to be a disconnect between how the economy is performing and how voters actually feel about the economy, which remains, you know, still what they rank as their top priority, that and inflation, which also has fallen, um, you know, from from its high a year ago to now, uh, you know, roughly just under three points under President Biden. So what, what is, why do you believe there is this disconnect? And is the Democratic Party somewhere in, in, in failing to really adequately sell uh, its uh, accomplishments with respect to the economy? Again, there hasn't been a campaign yet. So let, let's be clear. Donald Trump left us in a world of hurt. At the end of his term, this country was in terrible shape. And one of the reasons for that is that he was unwilling and unable to help manage one of the most serious crises that we've faced in this nation. It was Joe Biden that rescued the country, both health-wise and the economy. 
you saw, I mean, at the Wall Street Journal, you have the statistics. We were heading into a Great Depression. We were heading into a Great Depression, and it was Joe Biden that helped to rescue us from that, and importantly, to make sure that people got vaccinated. And, you know, the kinds of crazy things that get said on the other side of the aisle uh, about, you know, the, the Nobel Prize winning uh, vaccine, vaccine that was developed. Um, where people think that that's about, you know, injecting microchips into people's arms. I mean, that's what we're, that's what he was promoting, that kind of that crazy notion. And Joe Biden was all about the science and also making sure that we're getting people back to work. And boy, has he done it. If you look at the statistics, right, he's created more jobs in the last five uh, presidents and, and by far. And so I think that, again, when you finally run a campaign, because, uh, you know, the day to day of just the news in general doesn't give you the comparative. And once we get to comparing these two presidents, one who is is, again, someone who carries empathy and wears it on his arm and the other who makes fun of disabled people and who uh, attacks people who've been, you know, wounded veterans. Um, I think that people will understand that they need to step up and save democracy and vote for Joe Biden. You know, one issue that's been drawing attention both at the campaign level and also here in the Chicago area is the United Auto Workers strike. Now in its fourth week, yeah. also impacting plants here in the Chicago suburbs. All three companies um, at the center of the strike have laid off uh, hundreds of workers at this point uh, across across them. So what do you think the end game is here? What would you like to see? Well, sorry, just to back up, there's a strike going on. So there are people who are striking who aren't working. Mm -hmm. And then there are suppliers who, you know, if they're not building vehicles, right, then those suppliers are laying people mm -hmm. off. Just, just they've just cited, I mean, they've cited the strike as part of the uh, some of the companies have cited the strike in, in announcing some of these layoffs. Oh, there's no doubt. Um, I, I, all I'm pointing out is that, uh, look, this is something that, you know, the, the auto workers have felt left out and left behind by the creation of the electric vehicle industry in which the UAW really hasn't been able to participate. And uh, so there are a lot of people who are being underpaid some of those battery plants or at some of those EV plants uh, that are not part of the UAW. I believe that people deserve a fair wage. And uh, the UAW is trying to get that fair wage. Now, I realize I've been in negotiations uh, as uh, the state of Illinois with the unions on the other side of the table and as a business person before, and you've got to reach compromise and you've got to be rational with one another. And I know there's a, you know, sometimes vitriol that takes place and this has taken too long uh, to resolve, but it is the right thing. We are getting closer and closer to, I think, a compromise. You've seen that recently with some of the announcements, GM uh, coming to the table, Stellantis too. Uh, so we're, we're close, um, but it's, it's painful. It's painful for the people who are on strike. It's painful for the auto industry. It's painful the, for the broader economy. And uh, this is something that we're going to have to resolve uh, soon because it, it could sink the economy if they don't finally get to the table pretty soon. You know, you mentioned what is at the heart of, or one of the issues I certainly at the heart of these ongoing strikes, which is the, the potential impact on uh, manufacturing jobs when you talk about this broader shift to electric vehicles. And you've highlighted Illinois as a leader in the emerging EV industry. So looking at how this strike has played out, how do you balance that vision with these concerns around preserving jobs as the auto industry shifts to batteries over time? Well, I mean, there's no reason why we can't have an EV industry that has unionized labor. Um, and, and we do, by the way. I mean, there are union uh, manufacturing plants uh, in the EV industry in Illinois. Um, but look, um, I do believe that, uh, that it's not the government's job to say that, that there should be an agreement between uh, labor and management. It's their job to come together. It's our job to make sure that it stays on course uh, and that they finally reach agreement. So uh, we're excited about what's happened in Illinois. Rivian uh, went from being an almost nothing company to uh, hiring 
more than 8,000 people in Bloomington Normal. That's a big deal for Illinois. Um, Lion Electric, which I talked to for many months and attracted to the state, and they're a great company from Canada, uh, and they're making electric buses uh, in our state. Uh, Navistar, as you may know, is a, also making trucks and buses and is headquartered in Illinois. And then, of course, Stellantis had a plant that was open in Belvedere. Uh, and as part of this wrangling between management and, uh, and labor, they uh, closed that plant. And that really caused upheaval for 1,400 people in Belvedere. And I've been working both with the UAW and with Stellantis about reopening that plant. And I believe and hope that when there is an agreement, a national agreement between UAW and Stellantis, that we will see real progress in Belvedere. And you said you think we're getting closer to a deal. How much closer weeks, months? Listen, I'm not in the room. I don't want to suggest to you that I know exactly what's being said across the table, but I certainly call a lot of people to try to get a feel for it because it really does affect the future of our EV industry in Illinois, and I think that is where we should be focused. And in Illinois, I mean, we've been trying to attract suppliers uh, and uh, assemblers, manufacturers, uh, battery makers uh, to the state, and we've been successful at doing that. And if there is um, an agreement reached, we're going to see more and more of that. I, you know, I want to bring up a policy question that stemmed from the other strikes that we've seen in California that pertain to you know, the film and entertainment industry. Yeah. But Governor Newsom, governor of California, of course, recently vetoed a bill that would have given unemployment pay to striking workers. Mm -hmm. As a matter of principle, do you believe that uh, striking workers should be provided with unemployment pay? Look, it's not something that we have here in Illinois, but it's also uh, something I believe that, you know, when there is an unfair labor practice that's going on and that's, you know, caused a strike, um, it is something that I believe we ought to perhaps look at. But I, I also believe that we can bring people together to avoid those strikes. We don't have that kind of a problem in Illinois that they had in the entertainment industry in California that's caused this national strike. I, I will say Illinois has been rising steadily since I took office, and I'm very proud of this. We extended the film and TV tax credit in Illinois, and one of the result results of that is that uh, we've, we now have a record number of people who are employed by the film and TV industry. Um, it's 700,000 people that are variously uh, engaged in that industry in Illinois. I believe that we can do uh, much better than that. Um, sorry, did I say 700,000? 700 million dollars of activity and very importantly, uh, we have uh, the potential to reach a billion dollars very soon because our rivals like Georgia are really struggling where we are really growing. And, you know, kind of shifting gears a little bit from the issue of labor rights, I do want to talk more about your record here in the state of Illinois. We heard about some of it in that great introduction, and you've enacted a number of progressive uh, policies since you took office, including an end to cash bail, a ban on assault weapons, legalizing recreational marijuana, becoming a sanctuary state for women seeking abortions and expanding health access to undocumented immigrants. So when you kind of take a look at um, you know, these issues, which I want to dig deeper into, one thing that a lot of people have observed is we are in this very polarized environment nationally. <laughs> and there's a sense that blue states are getting more and more progressive and red states are shifting in the other direction, getting more and more deeply conservative. Do you feel like we are at a point now where we are, in essence, living in two different Americas? The great sort, as we've seen. Um, I, look, I, I do think that there are people who are choosing to leave places like Texas and Florida, which are taking away people's rights. I mean, if you're a, a parent of a transgender child, why would you stay in Texas? Why would you stay in Florida? If you're a woman who's seeking to exercise her reproductive health rights, uh, why would you stay in Texas or Florida? And we can name lots of other states like that right now, uh, or Missouri uh, or Iowa. The fact is that um, I do think it's important for us to, you know, to make the case to people that they should move to our state. But Here's what I would say to you when you say, well, the red states are moving redder and the blue states are moving bluer. 
I mean, does anybody think Georgia is getting redder? I don't think so. Uh, does anybody think Texas is getting redder? I don't think so. Um, and in fact, those two are great examples of a real shift that's happening in the South, where if we can protect voters' rights, right, voting rights in those states and many other Southern uh, states have excluded people of color or tried their best to do that. And there have been case after case after case that's been brought to protect their rights. And the more we do that, the more we're going to see people step up and go vote. And believe me when I tell you that, that uh, across the South that there are an awful lot of Democrats uh, who, if they show up at the polls, we will win. So I, I understand that there's a lot of vitriol between the parties, and a lot of that, in my view, was brought on by uh, Donald Trump and his failed leadership. But uh, I also think that you know that we. Uh, you know, we, we ought to be looking for ways to reach across the aisle to work together. I've tried that in Illinois. I have to say, um, we got a lot done in a bipartisan fashion in 2019, my first year in office, because I sat down with Republicans and tried to work with them to make sure they were getting things done uh, while we were. Um, in 2020, when COVID hit, it's like they all ran for the hills. Uh, you know, they, they, it was, I mean, because of Donald Trump, in my view, um, there were early moments of COVID where uh, there was a lot of collegiality and working together. And then it became a partisan endeavor in which people were, well, calling out crazy things like microchips uh, that ultimately would be injected into you or that, uh, that, you know, we're trying to suffocate people with masks. The reality is that we did better than most states in Illinois because of uh, the COVID rules that we set. And that's mostly because of people in this room and people across the state doing the right thing. And let's talk a little bit about some of those issues that I mentioned uh, with respect to your record here in Illinois. And I especially want to touch on Illinois having become the first nation, uh, the first in the nation to end cash bail. Why was that such a priority for you? Well, I mean, I, I have to say that cash bail has not worked in this country. It just hasn't worked. Here's what happens. Um, as you all know, if you're poor, you end up stuck in jail. That's just how bail works. And so that doesn't seem fair at all, because the person who's not poor, who commits the same crime, is out maybe the same day or the next day. Um, I think we all understand that's not fair. Now, at the same time, uh, remember, ending cash bail also means that people who've committed heinous crimes, um, murder, rape, et cetera, they get kept in jail. It's not that, oh, you know, it used to be that, that you know, they got bail. Maybe the bail was set high. But again, if you could afford it, you were out. And it, 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 the whole system is turned upside down uh, as a result of this, you know, failure of bail working across the country. So it, it has worked to end cash bail in certain cities. And so we worked on making sure that we did that here in the state of Illinois. Um, and, and honestly, so far it is working. Um, and I, there is a lot of adjustment that needs to be made. Um, state's attorneys are not used to having to go in and make a case for keeping somebody in jail who is a flight risk or a danger to the community. They're not used to having to make that case. They would just go in and say, we want this much bail. Right now they have to actually make a case about why someone needs to be kept in jail. Um, and judges, it's new to them too, right? It was also something where they would just sit there and put numbers next to each case and say, well, this is the bail for this one, this one, this one, this one. There's actual work that has to go into it. And so this is an adjustment that we're making, but so far it is working. You know, you, you mentioned some of this, but cash bill, many studies have shown disproportionately affects black, Latino, and low-income people. Um, you know, it, it certainly gained a lot more attention at the national level in the aftermath of the police killing of George Floyd as there was this broader national debate around uh, racial justice reform and, and, and also criminal justice reform. You know, it's been, it's been more than three years since uh, the killing of George Floyd and the nationwide protests uh, that we saw across the country, and yet, um, at a at a national level, at a federal level, there really hasn't been any meaningful change with respect to police accountability and uh, racial justice more broadly. 
What else do you think needs to be done, both here in the state of Illinois as well as more broadly across the country? Well, at the federal level, there's divided government. I mean, the, this is, you know, when, if you want to know why we haven't made a lot of progress at the federal level, it's that. Um, Republicans have decided to turn this issue into something. By the way, 10 years ago, the, uh, the Koch brothers made this a, an issue that they favored, criminal justice reform. And, all, and Republicans, because they were getting a lot of money from the Koch brothers network, were coming to the table and working on this. And then what happened, that money sort of went away, or at least they changed their view about criminal justice reform, and they all disappeared. It was all about the money, and they all disappeared on the subject. Um, we in Illinois uh, we have been able to make a real change, and I think very, very positive change. Again, this is about fairness, and we've been one by one going after how to make sure that, that poor people, that um, you know, that uh, people who live in communities that have been left out and left behind uh, are, are not uh, um, caught up in the justice system in a way that's been unfair for too many years. And so we've done a lot on criminal justice reform, uh, have fewer people uh, in prison because, again, if you're a drug addict, what you need is treatment. You don't need to be sitting in jail or in prison. Uh, you need treatment. And so, you know, we've done as much as, as I think uh, up to now we've been, you know, able to accomplish because we've worked with people to educate them about this. But it's mostly been a partisan endeavor and it's unfortunate. You know, another issue that has been stalled for, you know, probably as long as any of us in this room can remember on Capitol Hill is the issue of gun control or stricter gun laws. And you know, we talked about the ban on assault weapons here in the state of Illinois. Now, you know, often what you hear from gun rights advocates is, when, they, you know, when they are speaking out in opposition to stricter gun laws is that you look at you know, a city like Chicago and you look at the rate of gun violence in Chicago, this is, these are their words, um, is that not evidence that some of these stricter gun laws don't actually work? Here's what it's evidence of. We need national gun safety laws. We need a ban on assault weapons nationally. We need to have, uh, you know, switches banned nationally. Um, Sixty percent. I mean, you, there is real statistics out there that you can look at. Uh, Sixty percent of the violent crimes committed with guns in the city of Chicago were committed with guns that came from Indiana, because they don't have any gun safety laws, really. Um, and, and, and for goodness sakes, um, Florida, where everybody's wearing a gun, you can wear a gun anywhere in Florida, uh, in the open. I mean, literally, they don't allow those stickers on the doors in buildings that say you can't bring a gun in here. You're literally prohibited from prohibiting people from bringing a gun somewhere. So you could be, you know, in the grocery store and, you know, 17 people are walking around with a handgun. Um, and, and, and by the way, you've seen this in the Capitol in Wisconsin and in Michigan, where people are allowed to carry AR-15s at the Capitol, right? That, that, that's allowed. So we need national reform. Um, and we've done what we can do. There's more that we could do, but we've done the things that we've done in the state of Illinois because we think it will make a difference, but it's false to say that uh, if there's gun violence in Chicago, it means that all of that is a failure. What it means is guns are pouring in from outside. Every state around us is a Republican controlled state. Kentucky has a Democratic governor, but a, I believe, super majority Republican legislature. Uh, Wisconsin, same thing. So these are Republican states and, and there's not a lot that we can do from Illinois to affect that. But at the national level, Joe Biden is in favor of, for example, a ban on assault weapons. And I've talked to him directly about how we could accomplish that. Mm -hmm. And one other issue that you have raised is um, your record on uh, LGBTQ protections in the here in the state of Illinois. Um, you know, you were talking about some of the proposals that Republicans have pushed at the state level targeting uh, the LGBTQ community, including restrictions on gender affirming care, bans on transgender youth participation in sports, these so-called bathroom bills. And this has actually really become a centerpiece of the Republican presidential 
primary. And I'm, I'm just curious, one, why you think that is, and two, how concerned are you about that messaging and that rhetoric and its impact on this debate more broadly across the country? Why is it? Because they don't want to talk about the real issues, so they make things up. The Facebook fakery that goes around among Republicans is crazy to me. Uh, the things that I see that are completely false, uh, and particularly on this issue, that there's, you know, that someone's promoting uh, that people become transgender. That nobody's doing that. And, and, and there have been protests at one of the great children's hospitals in the country uh, that has a program that helps families who have a transgender child or believe that their child might be transgender. And there are protests outside and, and, and f on Facebook threatening to attack the doctors who run the program. And let me just tell you that the parents who come to a program like that with their child have gone through so much to get there. Their child sometimes has tried to commit suicide because they didn't know what to do, because no one in their community, their own doctor, didn't really understand how they should be treated and, and, and what they could do for this child. And so they come to this program, and literally the program is saving children's lives. And why is it that, 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 that the Republican candidates can't understand that we ought to let people live how they want to live and let parents m manage the challenge of their own child's, whether they're transgender or they might have you know, other challenges that they need to get through. But, but why do we not, you know, they talk about how we're you know, taking away parents' rights. They're the ones, they're the ones who are attacking parents. Uh, and we need to call that out. And I, I can't tell you why exactly that this has become a thing in the Republican Party, because it used to be the Republican Party was, even if I disagreed with them, a, a bunch of rational people. I now no longer believe that, or at least the majority or those in control. And I'm very deeply concerned about that. We need you know, two functioning parties, and right now we don't have one of them. I have one more follow-up question on this, but I know we're going, we're going to be taking some audience Q&A in uh, very shortly, so if those of you who have questions want to line up, I would uh, go ahead and do so. But you know, on, on this um, subject, it kind of takes me back to the earlier question I asked you about this idea of two Americas. Um, you mentioned there are people who are moving to Illinois um, if they're seeking gender-affirming care or if they're seeking access to abortion. And you hear sometimes from you know, factions of uh, Republicans that maybe they're moving to Florida or they're moving to Ohio if they don't want to see some of the uh, more progressive policies that you know you've enacted uh, in their state if they don't want to see you know they don't want to see transgender children participate in youth sports teams um, so doesn't that concern you uh, this this pulling apart of the country and kind of bringing it back to President Biden. You know, he often says, I've covered him for a long time, that this country, you know, is founded on an idea. You know, it's a great experiment. Are you concerned that the experiment is at risk of failing? Look, in order for us to get past this, we've got to break the fever that has overtaken the Republican Party. And the only way to do that is to beat them. Plain and simple. We have got to go, Democrats have got to go beat them. Um, that the, the, the extreme positions that people like Matt Gates and Marjorie Taylor Greene, and I'm just naming a couple, but think about those that just go along with this, right? And the ones that have given up and decided, well, whatever Donald Trump says, I'll have to go along with. And of course, privately, they'll say, I don't believe in any of that. And then publicly, they go vote for it. Um, so we have to break the fever, and, and yeah, it's challenging, and there's no doubt about it. There are people that I know in uh, politics in Illinois who are Republicans who you know, seemed like they were willing to come to the table and work on things together who now feel they can't or they shouldn't because they'll get voted out of office because of what's going on within the Republican Party. They need to fight that out, there's no doubt about it, and we, in the meantime, have to go beat them. They will sort it out when they realize that they're just wrong and the voters see them as wrong. My last question to you before we uh, open it up here. There's been a lot of, I know you're supporting President Biden right now, but there has been a lot of, or there have been a lot of questions about your own political ambitions, and do you plan to run 
for president one day. Listen, I, I, I love. I went right for it. I didn't, you did. I'm going to beat around wow. the bush here. Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, I, I love being governor of Illinois. I really do. And, uh, and I, I, I wake up every day with the opportunity to lift up people in this state. And, and we're heading in right, the right direction. You know, our fiscal situation is so much better today than it was five years ago. And uh, I'm proud of that fact. It's allowed us to do many of the things that you mentioned that we've been doing, um, making sure that we have social services that people can you know, access, um, making sure that we're able to take care of people who uh, developmentally disabled, for example, who otherwise couldn't uh, get state services. I mean, we were, I don't know if you, any of you remember, but $17 billion in overdue bills uh, that the state had uh, just shortly before I came into office. So today we have eliminated the overdue bill backlog in the state of Illinois. We've balanced the budget five times in a row. Um, all of that has allowed us to, to move forward, and I want to keep us moving in that direction. So I'm focused on being governor of the state of Illinois and reelecting Joe Biden and Kamala Harris. But not a no. <laughs> All right, I'm, uh, we're gonna, thank you guys, thank you so much. Um, so we're gonna take some questions now. Why don't you go ahead and uh, please, of course, introduce yourself as you ask a question. Sure, hi, Governor Pritzker, my name's Jessica. I'm a 2L in the law school, and today we actually read a case that was featuring a merger and acquisition with your Uncle Jay, so mm -hmm. great to get to talk to you today. <laughs> Um, so I, I love that you talked about clean energy, and I know that the environment is something that's on a lot of people's minds, especially a lot of the young people here. And I think that something that we really can't get away from if we're really going to turn this situation around is animal agriculture. And I know that a lot of other leaders are looking at how we can invest in plant-based systems, especially considering that, I mean, reading the news lately with um, like a lot of the child labor and just like terrible things that have been happening in these facilities with, with the population growing, of course, they're going to be more consolidated and it's going to all turn into factory farming. Um, how can we address this as a state? Well, I'm so glad you asked because this is certainly a challenge all over the country. Um, and I don't know if you read recently that uh, Upside Foods, which is um, developing uh, as you they've not more than developing they are have developed already uh, the ability to make you know animal um, uh, you know meat uh, from cells rather than as you know the the kind of farming uh, with animals that causes so much environmental uh, damage so uh, so I'm proud that they chose to come to the state of Illinois. Um, we have to, this is just one of many in the agriculture field. Um, these are one of many things that we need to address. But I also want you to know there's a huge industry in the state of Illinois. I mean, um, both uh, on the animal side and of course, we're the number one producer of soybeans in the country and number two producer of corn. Uh, and FYI, the number one producer of pumpkins in the country. <laughs> and, and horseradish, uh, uh, and so uh, so you know the agriculture industry is very important. So whatever transitions we may need to undertake, we really have to be careful. This is you know about justice also for those farm communities. So again, I think there's a balance, and we'll have to go after it. But it's not going to be an immediate um, thing that we're you know we just shut people down and move to some other you know plant-based. Uh, uh, only uh, replacement for animal protein. Thank you. Thank you. And by the way, at 2L at, at U of C, I, I, I went to the other law school uh, up in Evanston. Actually, I was in the downtown campus, and, uh, and uh, my father was a, a U of C law school graduate. And I have to say, those three years were three of the toughest years uh, <laughs> that I've had in school. I hope you're getting through. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'm going to alternate from down here and up on the balcony. Do we have uh, any questions up, up on the balcony as well? Hello, Governor Pritzker. I'm Mitch Robson, a fourth year at the college. I'm a physics major and actually also a molecular engineering major at your Mang school. I wanted to ask, um, you know, just over two years ago, uh, you signed into legislation uh, a set of bills that your office described as establishing Illinois 
as the most welcoming state in the nation uh, for immigrants, which included funding illegal immigrant students' financial aid with taxpayer money and restricting local and state governments and how they can apprehend illegal immigrants. More recently, you penned a letter to Joe Biden saying that the burden of illegal immigrants has been laid, quote, upon a few certain states run by Democrats, which is untenable. But that's not fully true because for years, Florida and Texas have had a higher illegal immigrant population percentages than Illinois. So I'm wondering, is the reason that you kind of reversed on this issue simply because it's now causing myriad problems in your own state, or is there some other reason? Well, I appreciate your question, and I, I think I know from where it comes. Uh, I, I will just say that I believe that we have to help, for example, the state of Texas and the cities in Texas, just like we need to help other cities and states to manage the incoming immigration to the United States. Uh, by the way, you, you called these folks illegal. These are undocumented people. There are many of them in the United States already. They were here for, you know, for many years, uh, and they should be treated like human beings. They should be given an opportunity, a path towards citizenship. This is all about having comprehensive immigration reform. And in, in the absence of that, we as a state need to help manage and help these folks to get an education, to try and get a job legally. Um, and, and we have DACA recipients in the state that I believe should, we should just immediately give them all citizenship. Um, and, and there's so much more that we need to do. But, but what you're describing is not a, you know, a, as if the, you know, well, blue states uh, believe in immigration and red states don't. The challenge, I know that what's going on in Texas, the challenge is there are an awful lot of people that are in Texas, and it's not just the recent uh, challenge of asylum seekers who are legal, I might add, in this country. Asylum seekers are legal in this country, right? We have undocumented immigrants, and then we have documented asylum seekers. Um, we need to manage all of that, and, and it has been a failure of Republicans and Democrats, and we all need to come together to solve this problem. Now is the moment to do that. Thank you. I Thank agree you. it's a failure of both parties. All right, go ahead. next question, go ahead. Hello, uh, my name is Cameron Landon. I'm a third year in the college, and I currently serve as president of College Democrats here on campus. So my question is, recently the Princeton Gerrymandering Project gave the Illinois congressional map an F rating and classified none of the state's 17 congressional districts as competitive. Uh, in a recent article, the Washington Post claimed that this has hollowed out the political center, pushing both Democrats farther left and Republicans farther right. In this light, would you consider having Illinois congressional districts as well as other legislative districts in the state be drawn through a nonpartisan commission? You know, I want to have you pay attention to one really important thing. We did not create the problem that Republicans are having now. They are extremists that, you know, Mary Miller, who is a member of that crazy caucus uh, and is a, a representative here, a U.S. representative here in Illinois, legitimately beat another congressperson uh, to win the seat. He didn't run as good a campaign. Donald Trump was very popular in the area and, and chose to endorse her over the other Republican in that primary. Um, that, you know, that challenge is happening with Republicans all over the country. And uh, they're the ones who have this problem. I mean, they, like I said, there's a fever in the Republican Party. And in those primaries, you're seeing it. I think there's, you know, there's a, uh, a race going on in southern Illinois right now between incumbent Republican Bost, uh, Mike Bost, and uh, his Republican opponent, Darren Bailey. Uh, and I think one might say that, you know, the, you know, what is going on here? This is the Republicans eating each other alive. Um, so I, that article, I want you to look at the chart that's in the middle of that article. That chart shows the states that, that they said were gerrymandered. Do you know how many of them were Republican gerrymanders versus Democratic gerrymanders? I mean, it was like three to one Republicans over Democrats. So this is a national problem. If you're going to solve for redistricting, and the problem of redistricting, you have to do it at the national level. It cannot be done state by state because we would be unilaterally disarming as Democrats if we did that. Now, 
I happen to believe that we should have independent commissions. But the truth is that, that when I do it, Indiana isn't going to do it. Iowa isn't going to do it. Alabama's not going to do it. I mean, you know, maybe we should pair off Republican, Democratic states, you know. But, but the fact is, it's got to be a national solution. Thank you. George and I get it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Up, up on the balcony. Uh, good, good evening, Governor Pritzker. Thank you for coming to Hyde Park and the UFC. My name's Kenneth Newman. We've met a few times before. So I have not been really happy with your approach to the migrants. I really want you to, the state of Illinois, to go after Texas and Governor Abbott. I think he's abusing people by sending them all over the country. Yep. But I'm more concerned about our CPS students and their lack of athletic facilities citywide which leads to people going to prison. So I've been trying to have a meeting with your deputy gov uh, governor of Ed education, and that guy has refused to meet with me. So I was wondering whether you could help get that hap happen. I, I love that you got a microphone in I, this I, room I, to make an appointment with my deputy I, governor. I, 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 I love that ingenuity, <laughs> terrific. Um, I have tried, just wanted you to know. So, so I, I understand, and, and I, and I want to hear what your views are about that. And I will just say one of the challenges, I mean, just, just broadly, because I can't address the specific thing that you're, you know, you'd like to, to talk to us about. But I, I will say broadly, I mean, we, were, we still are underfunding our education system in Illinois. I mean, massively. Um, and we, we have this, uh, this uh, program that increases um, evidence-based funding program that increases funding every year by $350 million. And, and we've been doing that as, as much as possible. A indeed, we've done it virtually every year. And, uh, and more than that, we've put more money into education broadly since I became governor and I've only been in the office four and a half years. Um, we've increased funding for public education by more than $2 billion. Um, and that's a big uh, amount of money. It's a more than 20% increase. So, um, I, I, you know, there is a lot that we need to do that's underneath that, you know, just here's more money, right? We need to make sure that we have arts programs. We need to make sure that we have uh, uh, facilities, as you're talking about, for gyms, uh, making sure that we have sports programs. But there's an awful lot of Illinois that just can't afford to do it, and it's because of the way we fund our schools. It shouldn't be funded by, uh, just to, I'm sorry, I'm gonna go off on a tangent here, but I want everybody, there are a lot of smart people in the room. You know, when I took office, uh, about 25% of funding for education in Illinois was coming from the state. In the average state in the United States, it's 46%. 25, we were the worst in the country at 25%. Most of the rest of that comes from what? Local property taxes. There's about 8 to 10% that comes from the federal government. But most of it is local property. You wonder why local property taxes are so high in Illinois. It's because the state got out of the business of funding education. And if you don't fund it, you can't provide sports and arts and everything else. So, so I came into office. And by the way, the cupboards were bare. It's not like there was some treasure chest of money somewhere that we could spend on this. So you really had to balance the budget and make sure that we were running surpluses so that we could put money into education. And that's what we did. And I, I want to be clear that we're now, we've, we've made real progress. We've gone from 25% to 30, little over 30%. That's a big move when you're talking about a more than $10 billion state appropriation for education. So, uh, so we have more to do, there's more to do. And when we do that, by the way, it helps bring down local property taxes while also funding our schools. So I know that's a lot to digest, but just understand that it is my passionate goal, you know, that I'm really focused on making sure that we're funding our schools properly, which is the beginning of the answer to what you're talking about for CPS. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. It's a fun, fun little moment. Um, we have a lot of questions, and hopefully, time to get through as Sorry, many as we can. Sorry, I'll try to keep. So, I, I was just going to say, um, any other appointment requests? Hopefully, we can make <laughs> offline. And uh, feel free to keep the policy questions coming. Go, go ahead over here. 
Alrighty, um, good afternoon or good evening, I guess, Governor Prisker. Um, my name is Max. I am a third year student at the University of Chicago, uh, majoring in public policy. Um, I am an aspiring politician and public servant. Um, so Chicago, like many cities right now, is facing an extreme housing crisis. Um, and Illinois as a whole is facing a extreme housing crisis as well. A lot of displacement going on, housing insecurity. Um, growing up, I was also insecure with housing, so I kind of relate to this issue a lot. Yep. Um, do you have any plans or proposals to begin fixing this problem in Illinois? Um, and if so, what are they and why do you think they could work? And do you think this maybe is an issue that could use more federal support as well. Yeah, let, let me remind everybody that we're not alone in Illinois. You talked about Chicago, you talked about the rest of Illinois. We're not alone in Illinois. This is a, there's a housing crisis in the country right now. So uh, there does need to be more that's done at the federal. I don't want to push you know, the answer to just the feds. We introduced, I introduced and got passed in this last budget, something called Home Illinois. And it's really focused on, fo focused on ending homelessness in the state of Illinois. And it, that, that includes a bunch of levels. It's not just, well, let's build a bunch of shelters. This is about really at every level, making sure we have transitionary housing, making sure we have shelters, of course, for emergency housing, but also getting people into actual homes that they can own. And, uh, and so we have between the Illinois Housing Development Authority and the work that they're doing to provide subsidies to people to, to for down payments and for, for managing their mortgages uh, to uh, this Home Illinois program uh, where we're helping cities to functionally end homelessness. Rockford, Illinois, if any of you are from Rockford or know people in Rockford, Rockford actually is the first city in the country to functionally end homelessness. That's pretty impressive. And we're trying to replicate what they're doing. It's a national endeavor, but Rockford happens to have been the most successful. We want to do that all over the state. And so that's that's part of the answer to your question. Thank you. Thank you. Um, back to the balcony. Hello, uh, I'm Bhargavi. I graduated from the policy school in 22. And I'm currently working with a lot of community health care centers and also people living, uh, people with lived experiences on either Medicaid or Medicaid churn. And I can give some context, churn being people losing eligibility due to certain uh, circumstances such as them experiencing homelessness or changes in income. And during the pandemic, the federal government came up with this policy where that nobody's going to experience churn. And, uh, your, you personally have worked with undocumented individuals, uh, providing them access to health care. And so this is a two-part question. One, because uh, the federal policy has come to end this year, and we did see that in Illinois, because of that uh, continuous coverage, there was an increase in health care coverage for individuals. One, because that policy is coming to end. How does Illinois see covering individuals for health care? Two, again, because we have undocumented individuals that we are supporting and our state is supporting, how do we again uh, uh, provide healthcare for them? So in both of those areas, we, we've made a lot of progress. One is the redeterminations that you're talking about. People, uh, just for everybody's edification during the pandemic, the federal government said, you know, it's too hard to redetermine, which is something you do every year for someone who's on Medicaid, you know, are you still eligible for Medicaid? During the pandemic, the federal government said, we're not going to do redeterminations and you are not required in the state to do redeterminations during this period of time. That's now coming to an end. It's, it's, it's ended. We essentially have to do redeterminations and are in the process of doing that. We've been very successful at keeping people on Medicaid in the state of Illinois as we're uh, doing these redeterminations. That is, making sure we're doing a, a great job of finding people. You talked about people who are homeless, who may have gotten Medicaid coverage, but now you can't find them um, to redetermine them, and therefore they'll drop off. So, so we're doing, a, I think, a pretty good job of identifying those folks more to be done, working with local organizations to make sure, because they're the ones who know where these homeless folks are uh, that need to go through redetermination and then helping them through it. So redeterminations is one big uh, uh, piece of that. And then you talked about undocumented immigrants and the, the coverage that we're providing to them. 
Um, we basically created a program in Illinois that provides, I would call it Medicaid-like coverage, because you're not allowed to give Medicaid coverage to people who are undocumented, federal law. Uh, and so, but we, we nevertheless have provided a program for people um, essentially 42 and older. Uh, and so we, we have been working very hard to change the structure of that program so that we can cover more people by virtue of lowering the cost per person. When the program was created, nobody thought it would grow to the point that it's at. And it, it isn't run under a Medicaid-like kind of cost containment, um, and, and we needed to do that. We're now in the process of engaging that, and I believe that we're gonna see real results going forward so that we can reopen those programs to more people who are undocumented. Thank you. Thank you. Hopefully just time for a couple more questions, mm -hmm. and if we don't get to you, we're very sorry, but we'll try and get through as many in this little Nobody's asked a yes or no question. Yes, I say. If you can keep them concise, that might help us cycle through a little bit more. Thank you. Hello, Governor. Uh, my name is Tyler Shastine. I'm a second year in the college and also a resident of small town Carterville in southern Illinois. Um, so as someone who has four siblings who were adopted through the foster care system, I'm deeply concerned with the continued issues that system has seen uh, through the years uh, under your administration. According to several court orders, um, many children are being locked in psychiatric hospitals and temporary shelters for more than a year. According to CBS Chicago, 41% of children were moved four or more times in their uh, span in the child welfare system here in Illinois. Uh, 7,000 children were placed 20 or more times and 44 children were moved a whopping 100 times through the foster care system. Uh, how do you justify these ongoing issues and the apparent lack of progress despite a massive increase in the funding for the Department of Child and Family Services and several campaign promises to overhaul and fix this system? So I appreciate the question and this is something that concerns me deeply. In fact, um, as you may know, for 20 years before I became governor, this department has been neglected. And indeed, when I came into office, I looked at this and brought in experts actually from the University of Chicago, from Chapin Hall, um, to help us evaluate what we ought to fix and how it should be fixed. Um, and to be clear, these are not things that you can snap your fingers and fix overnight, especially I'll give you an example. You talk about people being moved from one place to another quite a lot. You have to have beds available. I know we're running out of time, so but I just want to say you have to have beds available when when you take somebody out of their home because there's abuse or neglect that's alleged. You need to be able to put them into some sort of housing situation. And it's not like there are a whole bunch of families that just have their doors open to anybody. We have facilities, beds that the state of Illinois had in years past. When Governor Rauner was governor, because of the two years without a budget, uh, most of those beds went away. And just to be clear, when that happens, those organizations use those beds for other purposes, right? And the, now we came back at it to say, hey, we need 100 beds. By the way, we lost something like 600 beds. Um, I say beds, but you know, facility uh, opportunities for, for kids to be placed. Uh, it, short answer to this is that we've been working at reinstating those contracts. Um, and it is hard to do because it, these are literally, it's brick and mortar trying to get contracts. These are uh, organizations that were shorted by the state. They weren't paid. So now the state comes back and says, we'd like to have a contract with you to provide services. And their answer is, we did that once. We can't afford to do that again. We almost went out of business. So this is a real problem, right? And so we, we've looked at lots of different ways to try to address that. I, I don't want to suggest to you that we have uh, that we are on the golden path to success yet. I will say we've made a lot of progress. Just to give you one example, we have a, uh, a hotline. Um, if you witness uh, or believe that there's abuse and neglect, um, you can call that hotline to report it. Mostly there are mandatory reporters, right? People who are required to report. Teachers are an example of that. You know, we, had, we looked at this and 50% of the calls were going unanswered by the state. 50% of the calls that people were making to the state, people would leave messages and maybe they'd get back to them, you know, that, you know, a week later. 
this is a huge problem, especially if there's real immediate harm. Um, so we completely changed that system, and now more than 99% of those calls get answered on the first call. And I, I'm very proud of the, the change that we've made, but it's like there are about 83 things that need to change at the Department of Children and Family Services. And we've been able to check the boxes on some of them, but not all of them. But an important part of it is you got to fund the uh, department so that we can hire more, and we have investigators, and make sure that we've got the right kind of care that we can provide to these kids. It's going to take a little while longer. And as you know, we're going to be out looking for a new department uh, head for DCFS. And I think that offers us yet a new opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. I think we probably have time for one more question. One Nobody's more. asking easy questions. Uh, well, these have been fantastic and well-researched questions, they I have are. to say. So this, uh, our last question, I'm sorry if we didn't get to you. I'm going to go back to the balcony and to everyone else. Thank you, of course, for being here and being uh, prepared with your questions. And hopefully another time we'll have uh, another opportunity. Um, up in the balcony. Hello, Governor Pritzker. It's nice to be here. Um, my name is Lily Brown. Um, I am the... I'm on the National Coalition of Blacks for Reparations in America, also known as INCOBRA. I'm the National Youth and Young Adult Co-Chair. And so uh, I understand that the General, Assembly the General Assembly recently established the African Descendant Citizens Reparation Commission mm -hmm. this summer. And the commission is charged with making recommendations, holding meetings, providing reports, and performing actions regarding the preservation of African-American neighborhoods and communities, uh, building and developing vocational centers for African people of descent who are uh, descendant citizens, ensuring proportional economic representation in all state economics, and creation and enforcement of an Illinois slave era disclosure bill. Can you let me know where you all are in that process, even though it just started? Yeah. Um, well, obviously, the creation of the commission, you know, allows us at least to not only have meetings of the commission, but also reports. Um, there's an awful lot that, that we don't know yet uh, for the state of Illinois and how you might uh, go about providing reparations. Um, and uh, honestly, that, that new commission, I think, is going to be a huge benefit to us. Um, but, uh, you know, that's a process that's going to take us certainly a, a number of months to finally get some real reporting out of a you know, group of folks who uh, care deeply about this and who will help the legislature and me as governor to figure out how we might move forward for reparations um, and how that would be carried out. Thank you so much to everyone for being here. Um, and thank you so much, Governor Pritzker, for your time. Thank you. Um, really thoughtful discussion, and hopefully we'll have an opportunity to do it again sometime. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thanks for watching, and if you haven't already, please consider subscribing to our channel. And while you're at it, please leave us a comment. Thank you for watching.